as we talk about symbolism and imagery, think about the contrast of Jacqueline Kennedy with the four women who preceded her in the first lady's position. First of all, Jacqueline Kennedy was only 31. Imagine that, 31 when she became first lady of the United States. Lou Henry Hoover, who's in the top left here, followed by Eleanor Roosevelt, with uh, Bess Truman then on the top right, uh, followed by Mamie Eisenhower, the immediate predecessor to Jacqueline Kennedy, were all much older. They were in their 50s or in their 60s when they came into the White House. A bit matronly, some might say. They had uh, grown children, uh, and many of them already had grandchildren. So if people looked at the First Lady, they might think of her in a grandmotherly way or as an elderly aunt. Now look at Jacqueline Kennedy and how she presented herself in her wardrobe, just as an example. This is a photograph, uh, obviously in color, um, of her with the president in Mexico in a trip they made there in 1962. This is at a luncheon where the president spoke about the friendship between these bordering countries of the United States and Mexico. But he said, um, my wife speaks Spanish, and so I'm going to let her come to the microphone. So in Spanish, Mrs. Kennedy speaks to the gathered uh, Mexicans in the audience at this luncheon, and look at what she's wearing. Sleeveless, pink, and a jaunty pink straw hat. Very different from what most older women wore at the time and very different hairstyle. At that time, she was wearing it in a, a lengthier uh, bouffant, might, one might say. Very different from the kinds of hairstyle you're seeing with Mrs. Hoover, Mrs. Roosevelt, or, or Mamie's famous bangs uh, in the 1950s. So her first, uh, I would call it substantive approach to the White House and her first ladyship, even before her husband's inauguration, was to indicate that she wanted to restore the White House. And by this, she meant that when she went there and was toured uh, just before the inauguration by Mamie Eisenhower, uh, she was very upset at how the White House looked. She said it looked like the furnishings had come from uh, sort of a middle scale department store and that the furnishings, and by the way, up until this point, presidents could take away the furnishings of the White House. So many of the beautiful antique, classic, traditional historic pieces had disappeared around the country and they had been replaced with um, what, what looked like sort of colonial reproductions. And, and she, as someone who had grown up used to the finer things in life and then learning about the, the French way of presenting uh, state institutions, she thought that this was an abomination. And I'm pointing out her desire to restore the White House uh, just at the time that Professor Richard Neustadt, who was and became the what was considered the dean of presidential scholars at this time, he was at Harvard, wrote a book in 1960 called Presidential Power. And a person who had an, a Harvard connection, of course, John Kennedy, that was his alma mater as an undergraduate, loved that book because it was a very pragmatic approach to presidential power. Usually scholars up to that point talked about presidential power as it related to powers and authority granted in the Constitution. But Professor Neustadt said that presidential power is the power to persuade. And so in some ways it moved power from the Constitution to the White House and how the president was reaching the people from the White House and when he would go touring around the country and the world. So is it an interesting coincidence that Mrs. Kennedy focuses on the White House and restoring it to its true nature and history at the time that scholars are seeing presidential power tied to that icon and to that building. In addition, Mrs. Kennedy established the White House Historical Association in 1961. It became the first of the three branches to have a historical institution related to it, soon followed by the Capitol and about 10 years later by the Supreme Court Historical Society. But it was a, a true innovation of Mrs. Kennedy. I, I should tell you now, I have the honor of serving on their board of directors. And one of our missions, as Mrs. Kennedy hoped it would be, would be to preserve the White House as an icon for our country and for those around the world. Uh, she also uh, hired the first White House curator 
Uh, she helped to produce the first White House guidebook, which is now in its uh, multiple printing. I think it's up to its 20 some odd printing. Uh, the White House Historical Association helps to take care of that. Mrs. Kennedy worked with the National Geographic Society to make sure there were beautiful photographs. And one of the reasons that she thought there should be this beautiful guidebook to teach people about the history of the White House was that her first trip to the White House was when she was an adolescent. And she was disappointed that there were no takeaways, um, physical takeaways. There were no brochures, certainly not a guidebook. And she wanted to make sure that the thousands of people who flocked to the White House as tourists would have uh, pay $1 to take away this beautiful guidebook that they could learn more about its history. And then many people know about the famous tour that Mrs. Kennedy gave of the White House uh, on February 14th, Valentine's Day, 1962, with Charles Collingwood of uh, CBS News. And she took him on a tour with cameras around the White House to show him what she was doing, explain the restoration of the White House. And at the very end, President Kennedy made a cameo appearance. And he said how proud he was of his wife that she'd undertaken this project, but also that the White House was a symbol or icon of American democracy. And he, he noted that when our country was founded in 1776, he said there was a, an emperor in what he called Peking, we now say Beijing, there was a czar in Russia, there was a king in France. In other words, we have one of the oldest democracies in the world based on a constitution, and the White House is a symbol of that democracy. Why was that important? at the height of the Cold War, when we're fighting the communists and trying to bring other countries over to our side, the free world side, rather than the communist side. And so this tour of the White House became, um, if, if I can say so, a piece of propaganda that the US Information Agency sent behind the Iron Curtain to uh, give hope to the people who were living under Soviet domination. Another of Mrs. Kennedy's approaches to her first ladyship, because she was so good at this, was state entertainment. She and President Kennedy gave 16, by my count, 16 state dinners, that is for special guests, particularly for leaders of other countries. Just to give you a contrast, uh, George W. Bush and Laura Bush, who were not nearly as interested in uh, throwing uh, grand state soirees, they were a little bit more down to earth with their Texan backgrounds. And this was after 9-11 that they served uh, their eight years in the presidency. But in eight years in the White House, the Bushes gave no more than a handful of state dinners. The Kennedys in 1,036 days gave 16. And one of the most famous is the Nobel laureate dinner. So they invited Nobel laureates from this hemisphere uh, to come to the White House. And so one of my favorite photographs is of President and Mrs. Kennedy sitting in the, uh, the East Room as they are entertaining their Nobel laureate guests. Uh, Pearl Buck, the author, is to President Kennedy's right. And she seems to be... Uh, chatting with him perhaps about her books. One of them was The Good Earth. But notice the body language of Mrs. Kennedy as contrasted to President Kennedy. President Kennedy's leaning back a little bit from the formidable Pearl Buck, whereas Mrs. Kennedy is leaning into the poet Robert Frost, who had also read a poem of his at the inauguration. And I will talk to you more about Mrs. Kennedy's use of, of body language and how she spoke as one of her elements of what we tend to call soft power of first ladies. Then note above on the right, the president of the Ivory Coast uh, at the White House for a state dinner with his wife. It's particularly important to note that leaders from countries of color, from Africa, from South America, sometimes from Asia or South Asia, uh, would, and particularly the one on the bottom, South Asia, the uh, Pakistani president, his wife, President Khan and Mrs. Khan, uh, this was at, the, at Mount Vernon where the Kennedys chose to entertain him. But it was particularly important that some of these countries that we would then call third world nations, or now we'd say under, undeveloped countries, but, but the communists were trying to get those countries to join them. And we were trying to get them to join the United States and the free world. So there is a political reason to have these social events, these state dinners to impress upon these leaders, come with us, we're, we're the better uh, approach, we're the better regime, democracy, a republic rather than communism. 